Well, a very good friend to the BCRTA is back again. Linda Faucus of the Glue Society has been uh, a wonderful partner for us. She has uh, provided so much great uh, information along with her uh, compatriots at Glue Society uh, regarding tech and specifically tech in the world of retirement. And she's back again today to talk about a pressing topic, topic that we're all interested in. And uh, David Denier, chair of our communications committee, is here to ask her some questions about AI. Take it away, David. Okay. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Linda, for making time to do this for us. I re really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, it's been a, it will be a pleasure. So thank you. Um, I mean, we're now firmly in, it seems, the age of AI artificial intelligence um, but it seems to me in reviewing what is read about what I've read about it is there's no real agreement on exactly what AI or artificial intelligence is so as a kind of baseline for us to start on um, what's your view of that? Yeah I think it's a great question because it is a mixed up world right now if we track back, let's pretend we're in 2022 when the world was a little more, AI was a little bit more unnoticeable. It was hidden in plain sight when you were using most of the device. Oh, sorry. Most of the devices that you're using. Um, for instance, if you were doing, um, you were writing an email and there was content, you know, coming ahead of your, what you're writing. So predictive text, that's AI. Spell checking, that's all AI. Uh, you're on Netflix and you're getting some form of recommendations for what to watch. That is all AI. So it was in our lives and we didn't, we liked it and we didn't pay much attention to it. I don't think anybody stood up and started beating the drum that it was going to, you know, start the next robot uprising. But move to the end of 2022 and we see Chat GPT, which is uh, one of the, right now, the most well-known brand of a uh, GPT, which is a type of AI that masters human, co human communication. So when you talk to a Chat GPT or a GPT, it's like you're talking to a human. And that hit us late 2022 for the mainstream world. And that's when everybody went, hey, hold on. We're now really blurring the lines between the um, what our computers could do and now what they can do and what humans can do. And that's when the conversation amped up. And we've now seen this conversation in the world, uh, specifically recently at Davos, lots of conversation around how AI is going to disrupt every industry. And that's a big part of that is this generative, this generative AI, the, the AI that can create content like text when you're talking to an AI, images, music, audio, all of that has hit us fast and hard in roughly the last year and a half. And I believe that's the AI that everyone's discussing when we're looking at those scary headlines or we're trying to figure out how AI fits into our life. I think we're really saying, how does generative AI fit into our new world. Yeah, that's a, a good segue into uh, what I was going to mention next, which again refers to some of the commentary on AI, which is on the one side very alarmist. You know, we're at the end of the world, basically, uh, if things continue to go in this direction. And on the other hand, there are those that are saying there's a, a great potential in AI. So what would you, what's your outlook at the moment, Linda? We're on the knife's edge of both answers. Yeah, it, it potentially could be, it will change civilization. This is, you know, a once in a species moment. This is an incredible time for us because the AI you're talking about there, David, is artificial general intelligence. And that is when AI is smarter than humans. And that is when the world, the apocalyptic fears of the world and the robot uprising, that's AGI people are fearing. The AI that we're talking about today, the generative AI that is creating content for us, um, is not going to do that. That AI is just going to help us do everything we do just way better. Um, 
And the AGI, though, is where the big fears come from. And that's what keeps people up at night. And it should. And we need to have global conversations about how we want to see AGI uh, be researched and developed. Who will own it? Um, these are just critically important conversations because every country on the planet that has the resources is try is going after an AGI. And those are companies within those countries. And there is a, a somewhat of an AGI arms race going. Nobody's created it. Some people are saying it may never be possible. If you talk to Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, who has created ChatGPT, he was in the news a lot recently, um, he will tell you we're right on track. We are working hard for it and it's going to happen. So the when will AGI hit us? It's really, really hard to say. Maybe never, maybe as early as 2040. I will say the new um, surveys from researchers who know the you know likely answers to this question better than I do have lowered the year from possible AGI from 2063 roughly down to about 2040. And that's with this generative AI in our world for really only about a year and a half. So I think these numbers are going to change a lot in the next few years. And and the long answer is, I believe that is the AI people are really fearing. And it really is a conversation that all countries are having. And um, the wealth that can be collected by these AIs is breathtaking. It's in the hundreds of trillions by some estimates. How that money gets dispersed back to humans. What is our role in a on a planet where we are the second smartest species? Those are big questions we need to have uh, with our governments, with ourselves, with the world. It's very incredible technology that's going to, that, yeah, it's, it's a game changer. I'll just actually put it into an interesting context for you. Um, OpenAI, the creator of ChatGPT, has an agreement with their shareholders and investors that if they achieve AGI, all investment bets are off. You're not allowed to invest in OpenAI. Your money that you put into OpenAI today does not get you a piece of AGI, OpenAI. That's how big a deal it is. So it is a literal world changer. And that is, um, that's for the better and very scary. Yeah. Uh, and following then from that, let's look at the AI that's going to be helpful to us. Um, hopefully. Um, in what areas then do you see AI being value, uh, being of value, particularly for our senior uh, population? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at the uh, AIs that assist in our lives. Those are the ones that we don't notice so much. It just makes a lot of the technology we use possible. We'd also be talking about some generative AI technologies that are um, that we'll talk about in a second, but um, that are built into our interface or our experience with basically the robots that will start to populate our environments. So for people not in the workforce, it's an easier question to answer today for the workforce because AI is going to start seeping into companies at a very rapid rate. But for people who don't have to worry about the work side of AI, I am urging people to get comfortable with the generative AI technology, something like ChatGPT, just so you can see what tech, what we're talking about. It's really hard to imagine what this does until you've experienced it, you just can't know. And what I'll say is that if I told you back in 2009 that you were going to walk around almost 24 hours of your day with a cell phone in your pocket, you would have said, no, I'm not. I would have said, no, I'm not. And look at us now, right? So it's it's really going to transform our societies and how we are as humans. And the only way you can grasp that is to use it. So I urge you to, to practice with it. And we have created the glue guide to AI for you to do that. And we'll share a link for you to grab that free resource to get you started. And the reason I'm suggesting you start there is so that you're talking from a place of understanding and knowledge about what this technology can do. And when we see the conversations you can have with a chat GPT or similar tool, Google's product is called Bard, and it's part of the Chrome browser, but not yet available in Canada. So these tools are like having a conversation with a human. And when we talk about seniors aging, you know, the older seniors among our population are 
companion robots, this is a really big conversation. Companion robots are going to be talking to us through an interface like this. So what do we think of that as seniors? Are we willing to re- um, create relationships with these AIs? Because it is a lot like talking to a human. Is this a conversation we need to have as a society about how we stall some of the social isolation and loneliness problems that we have with a great deal of our seniors in this massive country? And how comfortable are we replacing human touch and human, real human connection with an AI? But outside of chat GPT or any kind of chat, uh, any kind of GPT, I urge you to look at your technology plan for your, your aging proposal. What, what are you planning on doing? I said that a little awkwardly, but the bottom line is what technology are you going to lean on to be able to be the best version of yourself, healthy, happy, connected in your home? What tech are you going to use to do that? Because if you're not going to use technology, life's going to get very tough. It is much easier with technology, but the people I see who are retiring are very hesitant to bring new technology into their world. And these fears around AGI and the fears around new AI technology are, are slowing that down even more. So open your mind See what you can bring into your life and try to get really real about the data privacy risks. As I have mentioned before in previous conversations, people will say, I'm not going to wear a watch because it tracks me. I don't want cameras at home because they track me. And yet these are people on Instagram and Facebook giving up way more information to people who are going to use it in much less um, useful ways to you. So decide where your your data leaks are in your life. and and start to understand the privacy implications of this technology and weigh that against the benefits of it for you to live the best version of your life you can assisted by it. That in in effect, I think, begins to answer what I was going to ask next, which was basically should seniors venture into this world? And if so, what advice and cautions would, would you have? In other words, in, in, to get a little deeper into that, how should they go about it if they want to get into it? And you seem to be saying that we should. I am. And the reality is AI is going to move fast. It's going to change your world, whether you're involved with it or you understand it or not. So I'm a big fan of knowledge first. Just know what you can. I'm not saying you have to bring it into your life every day, but I urge you to learn how to use it. Um, I'd also urge you to understand uh, the the devices that you can use to make you live a happy, healthier life. And those are going to have some AI in it. So don't be afraid of it. It's going to move so quickly that really, if you're planning on living for the next six months, you're going to need to have an AI in your life in some way. And so try not to be afraid of it. And I would urge you to start venturing in with considering wearable technology, incredibly uh, useful long-term support for proactive health. That's one way to get into a side of AI. Another way to get into it is through a chat GPT, just to play around. You're probably already searching the web using Google search. Well, a GPT conversation is like a web search that is totally personalized to you, that can actually game change how you find information. And a really simple example of that is if you're planning a trip somewhere and you're not sure where you want to go in Europe uh, any time of the month or any time of the year, ask the AI that question, ask a chat GPT that question and see the answers you get back. And then you can dive into questions to the AI. You can say, well, I would like to, you know, I saw the Napoleon movie and I thought it was great and I want to get a tour of Paris based on Napoleon's um, uh life in Paris. And so the AI can give you the history and the map. And then you can say, yeah, but I want to make sure I get my 10,000 steps in on that tour. And it'll give you the routes, the actual street path to take to get your steps in. So it's a really personalized way to get the information off the web that that you want. And we're already kind of doing that with a search. But, you know, chat just takes it to a whole different personalized level. Just thinking of that uh, for the moment, would would that be would health, for instance, uh, which is high on the agenda for many seniors, maintaining health or trying to dis- discern what might be going on if there is some kind of issue, um, 
would that be an appropriate tool to use? Yeah. So where we're at with the GPT, chat GPT, for instance, or Google Bard is we can't rely on them. We wouldn't want to rely on them for uh, the level of advice we would expect from a doctor. We wouldn't want to trust that they are able to give us accurate information about conflicts between medicines, et cetera. So go, venture carefully with with health advice that's going to affect you immediately. But when we look at uh, strategizing how we can stay healthy enough to live independently, those are great questions for an AI. What do I need to do in my diet, my physical routine, my mental health to be able to live where I want to live healthily? And And here's the current status of my life. Like, here's my blood pressure. Here's how far I can walk without you know, at a certain heart rate or whatever, feed all your data in there and you're going to get an incredibly personalized proactive workout plan or exercise plan. I just said that workout or exercise, but health plan or whatever. Those are the sort of plans that you can look at and then use your common sense to see, is the AI right? Like, is it good to eat broccoli with sugar? Probably not. You know, so it's going to get things wrong. And so you want to use common sense and you might even dive into a good old fashioned Google search to verify some of that info. But we're not yet there that we can rely on it as a doctor. That, by the way, I emphasize the word yet. Of course, huge money is going after that market. And we're already using these AIs to um, assist with mental health issues, people who aren't ready to commit to a, um, a counselor, but are very happy to have a conversation with an AI. So AI counseling is becoming a very big market. But venture carefully when it comes to something you're going to put into your body, because the information could be wrong. So, and verify everything, just verify everything. That That's a, a, a great piece of advice, because that personally is one of the worries that I have, is being sure about what you're hearing, reading. And there's been so much about misinformation and fake news making its way into the AI world that it seems a pretty daunting task to be clear about what you're receiving. Yeah, and I think it actually, in my view, it kind of just got simpler because we can no longer trust anything we see or read online. You've got to make sure what you're looking at, you know, the deep fakes we're talking about, we're heading into an election cycle, super important that we are really aware of what we're looking at. Is that fake? Is it not fake? How are you going to know that? And I say it might have just got simpler because we're going to have to rely on only a very few number of websites to give us trusted information. We're no longer going to be looking at that random blog post that gave me some advice about something else. It's like, I don't know who that person is. I don't know where that information came from. So I think we're just going to start narrowing in and curating our trusted websites that we can. I, I'm a fan of the New York Times. I read what they write and I don't do a lot of fact checking on the New York Times. I probably should, but I don't. Um, if it was a smaller community newspaper, I might, for instance, or a blog post on it on a topic, I might. So, so find your trusted websites and stick to them and do what you can to avoid the panic of social media when we see these deep fakes coming through. A lot of Taylor Swift deep fakes out there in the world right now. Um, those are going to come at us hard and heavy over these next 12 months. And, and you just can't trust anything unless you can trust the source implicitly. It's, it's tough time for that. Given all that you've said, are you planning... Um, courses or offerings on glue uh, that would provide the, the ins and outs as well as some guidance around the use of AI, particularly, say, chat GPT. Absolutely. And I think one of the hardest things to do uh, as a person in the non-work world is to figure out how do I dip my toe into this water? Where do you start? Right. And so that's why we created the glue guide to AI that you can get for free. We will be adding content onto that. That is in an ebook format. Um, 
a lot of the things that we show in that guide, though, are quite interactive. We want to, we would love to be able to show you videos in the ebook, which we could in an ebook format, of course, but not in a PDF format. So if you're interested in a course on AI and actually to have some handholding to use a, a tool like ChatGPT or Google Bard, let us know. The way we decide what courses to create is straight up how many people want to take it. Um, so if, if that's a topic of interest, uh, the information on how to put your vote in for that will be in the Glue Guide to AI. I'd say start there. We did a, a really um, ruthless job of keeping that down to about 10, 12 pages because we didn't want to overwhelm you. We could have easily written 100, um, all, all written by humans, by the way. Um, so, so we kept it short just to give you the real taster and, and really useful, immediately useful information. But if you want to expand beyond that, use the info in that guide to let us know you want more. And we'd be, I'd be thrilled to create a course like that because because we we have to know how to really understand this technology, decide if it's for us. Are we going to be a better version of ourselves using it or not? Because if you're not, don't use it, but at least you know. How are we going to know when new AI technologies come around? How are we keeping our data protected? Are these companies we trust? How do we find out? So it's a it's quite a fascinating topic and you can see all the different areas we would have to veer into to cover what we need to know because it is, um, as you said earlier at the top of this, um, such an incredible time for our, for us to understand how to live alongside AI. And I will say maybe controversially, this is not a time to ignore a technology. This is a time to eyes wide open. If you're a curious, intelligent uh, person who wants to to benefit from the technology that's hitting us, dive in. It's just, um, it's a scary, wonderful place. And we need your voice in the conversation. I'll just stop in a second, but this is kind of incredibly important. We are the first generation of older adults who will use technology to age. And I can tell you the age of the people making that tech are not in their 70s and 80s and even 60s. These are young people. And we need to have our voice as part of that conversation. So do you like it? Do you not like it? How is it helping you? And if we're not using the technology, we're just going to be handed things. We're not going to be part of the process. So I urge you to become part of the process, at least through experience that will allow you to give reasonable and useful feedback. And I hope make you feel like you're part of the world because this is the world we're living in and it's changing fast and you are definitely not too old to keep up with it. And I mean, that is just so, so helpful um, to hear. Um, and just to circle back maybe to the beginning and as a way to sort of wrap things up, um, this incredible race on right now, which you alluded to earlier amongst Microsoft, Google, Amazon, There's, there are many, many uh, parties involved and they're all racing, it seems, to get to wherever this is going first um, and be the dominant um, force. Where do you see ultimately this going? Um, it's a bit of crystal ball gazing, I guess, but do you, you mentioned robots. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I've ever considered that a reality for everyday living. It's totally now, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, for instance, Elon Musk is bragging right now that his robot, obviously heavily um, uh, involved in AI, is really able to fold shirts well. That's, by the way, that's a really big deal for a robot to fold a shirt nicely. <laughs> um, but companion robots, home care robots, robots that are, can do stuff for us physically, window washing robots. We all know perhaps about the, the vacuuming robots, but um, these are gonna invade our spaces in a big way and that's all AI technology. So these companies are racing to um, build the devices that will complement our lives. We call them robots helpers, companions, whatever you'd like to call them. There's also the generative AI that is racing. The companies are racing to be the, 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 the company that's creating the best um, chat conversational AI, the image creators, the video creators. 
I can use a tool right now that I'm actually going to start training on my voice. So I can tell you, hey, everybody, I'm going to read you an article, but it's AI Linda reading it. And it sounds exactly like me. So everyone's racing to be the leaders in those categories. But in that world, we're still stuck to the math and code that those technologies were created with and were controlled by humans. And those, those technologies aren't going to take over the world. That's not till we hit AGI. And if we ever get there, an artificial general intelligence is where everyone is racing to. Microsoft has not put $14 billion into open AI just so they can have a better chatbot as part of the Bing search engine. They are heading to AGI. That is why they've invested and partnered with open AI because they're guessing, I'm guessing Microsoft is guessing that open AI has the best shot at achieving that. So that's where the big companies are going and you need big money to play here. And that is why the the power of AGI, if it ever happens, is definitely going to be controlled by a few. Um, and if, you're, if your instinct is to say, well, let's not create it, it's way too late for that. It, it's the, the cat is out of, you know, the horse is bolted from the barn on that one. Um, cat is out of the bag. So there's no stopping it um, unless... We have, and sorry, there's still no stopping it, but we still have to have conversations around how we want to see this deployed. What role does government have? And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, we didn't do a great job with social media, right? We've done a terrible job managing the companies that are creating social media that is wreaking havoc in our lives and especially in the lives of our young people. So I'm not super optimistic they're going to figure out something as absolutely mind-blowing as AGI, but we need to try. We definitely need to try. But the answer to your question in a long way is AGI is where people are racing. And for now, um, they're just using regular old AI that we see today, which is still incredible, as their training ground for getting our, you know, getting them towards AGI. Thank you, Linda. You've been super helpful and prompted so much thought. Um, it's going to take a little while to digest. Um, but I hope that um, our audience has learned as much as I have from you. I look forward to seeing what Glue has to um, offer in the way of help for us and will certainly be continuing to contribute uh, to uh, your work and the work of Glue. So, again, uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I will just say, you know, if you do get into a chat GPT, you can ask it what the future of the world looks like. What can all this technology do? It gives you fascinating uh, answers. So it's a conversation you can have all day long. <laughs> I want to ask a supplemental question to Linda here because uh, this content has been so uh, great and thought provoking. Um, I want to talk for a moment and get your impressions about how humans are changing. Now we're always talking about how technology is changing and it's shiny and we get all excited and we all run around in circles and it's all we talk about. Um, it, it occurs to me that when my grandparents were part of a movement, they would go to a place where they gathered with other people. When my parents were part of a movement, it might be because they were watching their favorite television show. When I was part of a movement, it may be because I was subscribing to certain uh, media uh, or interacting in certain ways. And when my children are part of something, it's because they're part of a social media movement. But the general trend has been for us to have weaker and weaker connections between one another in terms of our actual human connections. And you just highlighted quite beautifully how social media has been so poorly managed in terms of how it's invaded our lives. And we have record levels of depression amongst all age groups, but particularly amongst the age groups that are more invested in social media. Um, so when we talk about things like companion robots, when we talk about relying on AI, to um, help us plan for our dreams and so on. I really get the utility of that. But is there something in your experience or the way that you um, use technology personally and that you'd like to reflect on on this? 
how can we keep humans at the center of what we care about rather than just this technology? Yeah, it's a pr profoundly important question for us to think about and try to answer. I, I take part in a couple of examples from my life. My son lives in Toronto. I'm in Vancouver. Um, he's awesome at texting. We have a great com we have a great relationship in our texting world. Lots of link sharing and photo sharing and screenshots and fun stuff like that. Um, but it's not the same as when I can see him on a FaceTime. When I see his face, you know, I'm his mom and I can tell just by the way he's sitting or holding his shoulders, like what's happening. So I need to see his face. But it isn't the same as when I see him in real life. Of course, it's not the same. Um, when my mom, uh, who doesn't didn't live far from me, was um, it was hard for me to get to her for whatever reason in that moment. I was going to see her later that day. I wanted to pop onto a FaceTime just so I could see her, just to see how she was doing. So what I and then the studies that are showing that the more we do this video calling, interacting thing with each other, the more we want to be together. And so I think what we need to do as humans is start to understand we have different streams of connection and we shouldn't try to go for an all or one approach. That if, they, if we weave them together nicely, we can build relationships in these different environments that make us stronger, our relationships stronger, make us feel less lonely, allow us to have conversations that are ongoing my texting conversation with my friends and my son, as an example, that's an ongoing conversation. It doesn't end at nine o'clock at night or something. It's constantly evolving. And it really has sparked incredible conversations that I have with him that we don't get to do face to face because we're catching up with other things. So I think we need to learn how to weave all of this together and find a way to connect with the people that we want to connect with however we can. For me, with my son in Toronto and I'm here, I'm not going to get a lot of carbon on carbon time with him. I'm not going to see him in person very often. So I'm going to really go into that. I do go into the video calling and I do try to hear his voice on the phone. So, so when we talk, though, about social companion robots and helping deal with social isolation and loneliness in, in seniors, and these are generally older seniors who aren't able to easily get out of their house. I worry greatly about that. I, worry, I very much. I can see that being an off switch. Okay, grandma's got the robot. I'll talk to her next Tuesday. And that is no way I want to age. That's no world I want to live in, that we basically warehouse people with robots and check on their feed once in a while to make sure that they've, you know, they're sleeping fine and taking their medication. Prioritizing human contact, of course, but I will say that is a luxury. It is an incredible luxury. So can we find ways to really genuinely connect um, in different streams? And I think we need to work on that because I don't see a world in which we're able to easily come back together very often. Um, and I also just, I'm not a fan of the it's not the same as in person. So I don't want to do it. It's like, okay, but I'm all over the, let's just, let's go for the best case scenario in the moment. And it's not perfect. I can't see my son right now, but I can call him on video. I can video call him. That's the, that's the best thing in the moment. So let's just, I don't want to muddle our way through, but I want to open our minds to the other possibilities that we have with this technology. And I'll say some of these robots, by the way, you can do with people and you can do them with dogs even right now is you can have a screen on your robot, right? So right now you can, I could see my son, he could walk into this room right now on a screen. So that's technology that happens, um, is happening right now. So these weird ways, like, are we having robots in our house? Oh my gosh, that sounds weird. I live in a small house and I, am I going to bump into it when I walk into the kitchen? I don't know, but let's keep our minds open prioritize our human connections because if anything that we are learning about with AI is wow are those human connections really really so all we have everything else has to complement that but we can have human connections in different mediums so let's get good at that and let's not discount them because it isn't good old face-to-face -face communication right well we are so glad that the real Linda showed up to share her thoughts on this. And, it is. Uh, it, it has no been, fake. <laughs> it has been uh, very valuable. So thank you, David, for those uh, really insightful questions. And Linda, thanks for stopping by. And I'm really happy to tell everyone that uh, 
Linda and the Glue Society have a wonderful article going into the Spring Postscript all about AI that will unfold some more of these ideas. We look forward to seeing that uh, and look forward to uh, seeing you again, maybe in carbon form, maybe in some other form uh, soon again. And uh, thanks so much to you, Linda, and your team. Okay. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye, everyone. Mm-hmm.